hope that this plan does pass. Now, do I agree with everything in the plan? Oh, hecky, no. There are some things that I think that should be addressed, particularly I like greenery. I like the green stuff, but I think that there should be some houses. That, but I know that there's going to be just a limited amount of people in Flint. So you can't have houses just everywhere because you got stock and nobody to put in them. So I think it should be passed. I want to say um, welcome home, Mr. Early. And uh, nice to meet you, Mr. Police Chief. And I want to tell you, you got your work cut out for you. And I also want to tell you that I'm going to be on your trail because I live in the community and I shut the lights out at night. So I will be calling you and coming to your office. There are a number of things that are going on that I really wanted to talk about, but I just want to put this bug in your ear, Mr. Early. Citizens and their water bill. You will be hearing from me. I've asked for an appointment with you. I am one of the only agencies in this city that assists citizens with water bills. And I tell you, I just had an emergency heart surgery because this stuff keeps me up at night. When people call me in the middle of the night and say they turned my water off, and if they know my water's off, they're going to take my baby. Those things bother me. Um, I want the city council to please consider this plan. Megan, you did a jam up, snap up job, girlfriend. You really did. You conducted these meetings very well. You did allow all of us to have input. <clears throat> you came into our communities. If we wouldn't come to you, you came to us. You listened to what we had to say. And you took in consideration the things that we said. And you let us know, well, now you might not get that, but okay, you can put it there. You know, so those kinds of things really are important to people who are everyday people like me, day-to-day -day people who uh, work the midnight shift and the day shift and the morning shift and all those other shifts. So the thing is, please, my friend Joshua and the rest of my friends, please, please at least give it a chance. Give it a chance. We're not going to get everything in, in one year. We're not going to get everything in two years. We're not going to get everything in three years. But it's a what year plan? It's a 20-year plan. So we got to work on it. And that's all I have to say. Uh, you guys have a wonderful, wonderful good night. And please do the right thing. And I'll see you soon, Mr. Early. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Our last speaker for this evening, Madam Clerk. Our last speaker is Ms. Desiree Duell. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the planning staff, Megan, and associate planners, Kevin and Matthew. It's been such a pleasure working with them during this process, and also um, commissioners Rob Jewell and Elizabeth Jordan and Dean Walling. Um, I'm a community artist that engages in public practice. Um, I moved back to Flint in 2010 after being away. Um, and working all over the country. And I really was excited to be a part of this process because Flint has been a very unique position to start a public programming. And that's part of looking forward into growth. And um, there have been various experiences throughout the past three years that have called for an arts authority and that is going to be in the plan. And I hope um, that that authority can really come to fruition. It's so important that as we move forward, not only that public art be um, something that is enjoyed, but reflective of its community and have equitable representation of its community concerning ra uh, race, class, um, socioeconomic landscape, and that also that public art is not just something that we experience, but it does something. It helps us heal. Um, there's a lot of anger about a lot of issues, and we don't need memorials uh, about foreclosed houses that um, don't really do much. We need um, maybe a dialogue about violence. We need dialogues about people losing their houses. Um, we also need measures in place so that the city can reap the most benefit from public art. Um, 
both economically and um, that it provides a space that, um, that citizens get to be heard. And art does more than just make you feel. There's a direct economic impact to that. But also with public art, there's issues of sustainability, maintenance, and environmental impact. And the Arts Authority would help facilitate those dialogues and, and hopefully put policies in place so that the city can um, really have a wonderful uh, new way of doing art. Um, part of the reason why I was so excited about doing this is working in the city of Baltimore where gentrification is such a huge issue that someone working in the public realm, it almost seems overwhelming. And here we have a starting place. So I hope in the coming months that there are some action plans to move that arts authority forward and that it would encourage visiting artists, but also propel and raise the bar for individual artists in the city as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that, that concludes our speakers. I wanted to ask Megan if she would come to the mic and say a few words on the master plan. <clears throat> Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Um, I don't want to say too much because um, I think a lot of people said it a lot better than I could, but I did want to acknowledge our planning team, um, which is comprised not only of uh, the planning commissioners who've really led this process, and I just want to acknowledge eight of them are sitting in the front row, and the only person who's not here is Mr. David Jackson, who's been quite ill, but who's been really involved in the process to the point that he actually paid someone to pass out flyers about our meetings. Um, so he, he's been very committed, although not here tonight. But I also wanted to acknowledge the planning staff who have been um, incredible partners. I haven't always been the easiest boss to work with um, and who've done an amazing job. And I'd just like them to stand up if they could. Um, Sherry Pierce, who's the real estate coordinator. Um, come on, guys, stand up. <laughs> um, just so they can get some kudos. Um, Kevin Shrouds and Matthew Williams, associate planners, and Matt Filters, our policy um, and planning associate. And then also Vince Slocum, who may be, who's in, way in the rear, uh, who's our AmeriCorps volunteer, who's just been amazing in making all the phone calls. Um, and I also just wanted to, again, acknowledge Jim Richardson, who, um, along with Bob Wesley, co-chaired the steering committee. And I think they've really put our feet to the fire to really outreach as much of outreach as we could do to ensure that we could get the greatest voice at the table. And I think it's pretty amazing that we had 5,000 people involved in this process, um, a comparable city, Grand Rapids, who's double our size in their very um, well-regarded um, planning process had half this many at 2,500 2, people. So um, I think that's a testament to all of the people that have been really working in depth um, on this project. In the very best sense, this plan is truly the community's plan, and I really fundamentally um, believe that. I don't think uh, there is a single um, strategy that really didn't come out through um, that community process that reflects the community voices. And I think we were fortunate to have a great consulting team in Housesale Levine. Um, I wanted to recognize um, Devin Levine, Brandon Nolan, and, um, and John Househeel, who really helped us take that community voice and put it into this tremendous document that's before you. And I think people are right to say, is it a perfect document? No. Is it a great document? Yes, because I think it does reflect the will of the people. And moreover, it's a living document. It's a document that's meant to, to uh, be looked at. And hopefully, it's not another 60 or 50 years before we look at it. Hopefully, per the ordinance, uh, we look at it at least every five years and, and definitely make those needed revisions. I did want to say that this 63-day circulation period has been extraordinarily valuable to us. I think we took a good document and made it a much stronger document. And I want to thank the city council who really um, brought to us concerns that you were hearing 
and helped us further shape the plan in a way that um, I think some really significant um, changes were made. And so I really congratulate you for bringing those concerns to our attention because I think it's really important that we do um, create a document that takes into consideration uh, social equity and sustainability. There were a couple of uh, three main things I just wanted to highlight uh, in the new revised chapters that you have before you. One is we really uh, reform formulated the plan to make it much more reader friendly. We heard it was a really hard document for the average public to get through, so we pushed up the vision so it was clear what we were talking about, and we created an implementation matrix in the rear of the chapter. Originally, as you may have recalled, that we mentioned about being a standalone chapter, but we thought it was much easier to read if it was incorporated into each of the chapters, so those implement strategies are listed by topic area. Um, we clarified the land use chapter. We recognized that some of these new place types are a little obscure for the average person, so we really tried to fully explain the concept, make sure that the images were really reflecting what those place types meant, and we also um, clarified the existing rights of um, uses to remain, even if the, the new land use designations are different. And then we slightly modified the land use map based on community feedback. For example, I think um, Councilman Nolden's great um, comments about the fact that the area around Burston and Burston should be community open space because these are truly considered anchors to not only the, the north side but all of Flint. They provide really critical services moving forward. And then finally, we, we knew, and this was always reflected in the plan, that we really had to focus on neighborhood stabilization, that we heard over and over again from various different um, meetings that this was important. And so we felt like we needed to be a little bit bold and make a commitment of trying to raise $10 million per year to neighborhood stabilization and, dem and efforts such as demolition, trash removal, home rehabilitation, park improvements, and support for neighborhood services. And because we were cognizant that um, a lot of areas in the city didn't get equal investment over time, and some of this had to do with the displacement caused by I-475, there were urban renewal plans that were never put into action, and a lot of those communities were left out. So we knew that was really important. And so we allocate, we, in the plan, we state that 50% of these funds should be allocated for green neighborhoods. These are neighborhoods that have really been impacted by uh, the displacement that occurred as a result of I-75. Um, so now um, before you is this revised, I think much improved plan because of the input that you provided. And of course, as many people said, we know that we can't just um, let this plan sit on a shelf, but we're committed to continue our work with you to focus on implementation. And the next uh, critical steps in that implementation are working on the zoning code and working on the first combined capital improvement plan. And um, of course, our, our great consultants are here, and they will help lead the way in us uh, doing that necessary work as we move forward. So with that, I wanted to thank you again for your feedback and involvement in the process. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> Could we have the planning commissioners stand that are here this evening? Could all the planning commissioners for the city stand?